divided into the parotid, submandibular, and submandibular glands. The three major glands are there in our uh, heading of the major glands of salivary glands. Other one are the minor glands. Those are minor glands are the hundreds residing in the oral cavity like a pharynx and parenchymal sinuses. So here you can see uh, in major salivary glands there are some question marks over there and you can identify by yourself if you are going to be uh, study thoroughly the topic. The other first you can see here it is a parotid gland. Here you can see this is a parotid gland. And this is a parotid gland is uh, located on the over the uh, side of the cheeks. Second one is the submandibular gland. It is basically uh, below the mandible, below the lower jaw. Third one is the sublingual gland which is basically below the tongue. And uh, fourth one are the parotid duct. You can see the duct is basically a communication between the parotid gland into the mouth and the accessory parotid gland which is lie on the middle of the duct. So the first, so we are going to choose our parotid gland first. In the parotid glands, they have a borders, superior border, posterior, medial, lateral, anterior, and inferior. So one thing who had a superior thing, superior border, that one has also a inferior border. One thing has a anterior portion, it must have a posterior portion. So the borders is divided into superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, lateral, and medial. Superior has a zygomatic arch. The protein gland, there is a you can see here in the skull, there is a zygomatic arch. You can see by yourself in a very well way that this is a basically a is. This one you can see this area is a zygomatic arc is a superior on the angle of medieval and the posterior is a basically angle of medieval under the air lobe toward the mustite tip angle of medieval posteriorly you can see this is angle of medieval to the air lobe this is angle of medieval this one is makes the posterior portion of posterior you can see the protein basically we can uh, you can see here a, a a big shadow. This big shadow basically comes into in front of this parotid gland. So that's why this is so called posterior side. Posterior side makes an angle of medieval. The main, the angle of the medieval is making the posterior portion of the parotid gland. Inferiorly extend into the inferior aspect of angle of medieval toward the hyoid bone so inferior portion it's going through the mandible angle of mandible this portion the first it uh, angle of mandible making the posterior portion of the parotid gland and second this deep part is dipping to uh, toward the angle of mandible well middle border soft para esophageal base of skull lateral border are So lateral border below the skin of per peri auricular cheek upper neck anterior ribs around the ascending ramus of medieval. So these are the border. Anteriorly it basically had a ramus of medieval. Mm, posteriorly it is the angle of medieval. So you should clear about the borders of parotid gland. The parotid gland lie bit in between the medieval and the achromatic arches. Facial nerve which divides glands into the superficial 80% and deep nerve. So it is a main thing you have to remember about the facial nerve. The relation of the facial nerve. You can, this is an important point. Facial nerve is important in the parotid gland. So, parotid gland divide the gland into two portions, superficial portion and deep portion. Superficial is 80% and deep is low 20%. So facial nerve crosses when the facial nerve cross the gland, it shows you the superficial 80% and between the superficial and deep lobe. If you find the facial nerve, you have to stop and during the periodectomy, you have to find out the facial nerve. If you find the facial nerve, you have to stop it because you don't have to go to deep end. If uh, you are doing surgery of the benign disease, of the benign, benign tumor, 
So in the polymorphic adenoma, such as a polymorphic adenoma, you have to identify the facial nerve and then you have to stop it. So peridot duct basically it has a stenson, it is also called a stenson's duct. It is a five centimeter long, uh, which about uh, two to five finger inches, opens opposite to second molar tooth, and it is a it is a main point for that because it is a communicated duct between the peritoneal gland and mouth so it is a five centimeter long and it opens into the second molar tooth it is a very important point so first point was the facial nerve second point was the peritoneal duct so the lymphatic drainage is a pre peritoneal intraperitoneal levels one two three four five accessory peritoneal lobe presents twenty percent of the lobe so that these accessory portion I have discussed about this is accessory portion it lies only the twenty percent of the twenty and uh, only the twenty percent of the patients so you don't have to much more considerable. This is a very important thing because uh, the, I mean, the necessary things present so the disease will not subside when you are doing for that disease for specific disease for specific treatment. So here you can see now uh, about you can identify by yourself the what are they, what are they think, so what is this, what is that, so you would identify by yourself. So first of all this is a pin of air, you can see the air and this is a mustite process. Okay, this is a parotid gland, mustite process below the air. So this is a parotid gland and this is a stenocleidomastite. mustite. We have discussed earlier in the neck lumps about the stenocleidomastite mustite thoroughly. So this is a stenocleidomastite. mustite. So this is a parotid duct you can see here in the parotid duct uh, we will discuss about the 5 cm long and 20 cm, 20 percent of the patient here and SSC duct will be present over there. Okay, so this is a temporal branch of uh, Facial nerve. Now, the facial we are discussing basically the facial nerve here and the relation of the facial nerve about the structures. So, facial nerve's first branch is that we should know about the branches of the facial nerve. Facial nerve, what is the facial nerve? Facial nerve is a cranial nerve of a seventh. Uh, it is a basically arises in the cranium. So, that's why we always called it cranial nerve. So, cranial temporal branch it shows you. Those are the multiple branches temporal, zygomatic, buccal, mandibular, and the cervical branches. You must remember about this. Why we are mentioning why we are putting these names in the facial nerve branches because they are basically those things arising from that particular area, so that is called that nerve. So, because if you are talking about the cervical nerve, it arises from the cervical area. If you are talking about the mandibular nerve, it is arises from the it arises to, and it will deepen to the mandibular. If you are talking about the Buccal branch it, it arises in the buccal and it goes through the buccal area. So this is a temporal. Okay, this is zygomatic. Okay, it is a buccal. And you can see the temp temporal going to the temporal and upwards the air. It's a temporal region, so it goes to the upwards. So it's called temporal branch. Zygomatic is coming to zygomatic arch, zygomatic area, and an upper uh, air lobe. And buccal area is going to cheek, so that's why it's called buccal branch. And mandibular is going to mandible, so this is called mandibular branch. Cervical is going to cervical. So five branches you must remember about the cervical. Zygomatic, temporal, zygomatic, buccal, then mandibular, then cervical. So must now so mandible again. Also, we have talked uh, about the borders. That, that they, if the border here, if there is an anterior border, it should be posterior. If there is a superior, it should be the inferior. So that's why you must remember the borders also. So laterally, there is a proximal half of the mandible. So it lies on the mandible, like parotid gland lies on the end of the mandible, and it lies in the half of the mandible. So remember that thing. Posteriorly, anterior to the anterior to but near the low anterior margin of parotid gland. Okay. So inferiorly approaches the level of hyoid bone. The majority of the gland lies over the external surfaces of myelohyoid muscles, laterally to the laterally to and abuts the lingual and hypoglossal nerve and the medial to the marginal mandibular and cervical branches of the facial nerve. It drains into the duct in the anterior floor of the mouth. So there is a parotid duct, uh, parotid gland has a parotid duct, which is also called Stenson's duct, which is a 5 cm. And drains into second molar tooth. So, but the submandibular gland has the Warthans duct. Warthans ducts, and it basically drains in the anterior floor of the mouth. So, remember these ducts and their attachment with particular specific that type of submandibular gland. So, lymphatic density is level 1, level 2, level 3. Submandibular gland basically the 10% of size, spirited gland, 
located anterior floor of the mouth borders lateral medial aspect of the mandible inferior mylohyoid muscle so it borders literally medial aspect of the mandible inferior mylohyoid muscle lingual nerve courses adjacent to sublingual gland dens in the floor of the mouth through the rhina was struck lymphatic drainage level 1 level 2 level 3 lingual nerve courses courses adjacent to sublingual gland so sublingual gland basically 10% of size in uh, of the periodic gland if the periodic gland is a 30 kg <clears throat> it would be the 1 kg 2 kg or 10 kg like this one. located anterior floor of the mouth borders lateral medial aspect of the mandible inferior mylohyoid muscles lingual nerve courses adjacent to sublingual gland stands in the floor of the mouth through the rhina was duct and lymphatic drainage this is basically a particular shape of the specific person you can see here this is a pin of air the air lobule you can see the parotid gland here and parotid gland lies uh, below the air you can see the the posterior border of the parotid gland lies below the air okay and it has a simple uh, parotid duct which is called the stensis duct it is a accessory part of the and you can see there's a mesenteric muscle it's a mesenteric muscle it's all about the mesenteric muscles okay this is tenochtitlocide muscles okay and you can see here uh, the agomatic arch this is agomatic arch you can see here is a sublingual gland and the it goes down oh, so sorry this is a mandibular gland it goes down the part it, it, it drains the water ducts into the floor of the mouth this is the floor of mouth and you can see here this is a sublingual gland 10% of size of the present 10% of size of the parotid gland you can compare it very well the uh, lingual nerve adjacent sublingual gland so lingual nerve is passing through this one this is sublingual nerve okay you can see here it lingual nerve basically uh, sublingual gland is a, a near to sublingual gland okay now this is a hypoglycial muscles this is a diagastric belly this is a plateau small layer single layer cover mucous membrane cartilages and uh, so salivary now salivary tumor 7% of head and neck tumors predict tumors are the 10 times more common than the submandibular and 100 times more common in sublingual tumor. so the, uh, we are talking about the salivary tumors it is all head and neck tumors if you are counting the whole head and neck tumor there are 7% of salivary tumors are present if you are talking about the tumor of the head uh, of the tongue if you are talking about tumor of the eye if you are talking about tumor of the ear it's only 7% total tumors if you are counting about the head and neck tumors but the parotid gland tumors are the 10 times more than in the salivary glands in the salivary gland tumors the parotid tumor is a 10 times more common than the submandibular and 100 times more than the sublingual parotid are the 80% of benign now we are talking about tumors we are not talking about the uh, cancer we are talking about the tumor so the tumor if you are talking tumor the tumor either be the benign either be the malignant so the parotid tumor which are the 10 times more than sub mandibular and 100 times more than sub lingual they are 80% of the benign tumors so the parotid gland they are the 80% of the only benign tumors which are called pleomorphic adenoma so if the question arises from the parotid gland you should know about the pleomorphic adenoma and sub mandibular has a 50% like 50 50% malignant and 50% benign so 50% are chances to be malignant if you find out the there is swelling in the below the air and you are identifying that the swelling is arising from the parotid gland you should consider about the first you should start from the benign thinking there is a pleomorphic adenoma it is a benign thing but if you are talking about the at the at the level of sub mandibular area and you are you are you are uh, you thought that there is swelling which is arising from the sub mandibular gland so you can go for the malignant and sub lingual it's a 65 to 80% malignant because they are the Less chance to develop the below the tongue, but if you if you if you got the swelling in the below the tongue and you think that it's arising from the sublingual, you should go for the malignant. Sex is there's no male and gender proximities, risk factors, nutritional deficiencies, exposure to anal and radiation. Now these are the risk factors which can cause the cancers, which are the nutritional deficiencies, exposures to radiations, ultraviolet exposures, and the genetic disposition and Epstein Barr virus. Epst E P E B V is basically a Epstein. virus taken a question for virus okay fine benign tumors now we are talking about the benign tumor these are the pleomorphic adenomas we are talking only about the parotid gland so the parotid gland benign tumors is the pleomorphic adenomas malignant are the parotid mucoepidermoid most common low grade slow growing cur cured by surgery alone 
सब में सो बेनाइन ट्यूमर्स आर द पेलोमार्फिक एडिनोमास बेलेग्नेंट में पेरोटिड एंड सब मैंडिबुलर वी हैव डिवाइडेड पेरोटिड हैज अ म्यूको एपिडर्माइड मोस्ट कॉमन लो ग्रेड स्लो ग्रोइंग क्योर बाय सर्जिलोन सब मैंडिबुलर हैज अ माइनस लेवी ग्रेड्स एडिनोइड सिस्टिक मोस्ट कॉमन सो सब मैंडिबुलर हैज अ माइनस सब मैंडिबुलर एंड माइनस लेवी ग्रेड्स एडिनोइड सिस्टिक मोस्ट कॉमन सो यू मस्ट नो अबाउट द नेम्स ऑफ द ट्यूमर्स द सब मैंडिबुलर एंड माइनस लेवी ग्रेड्स एडिनोइड सिस्टिक मोस्ट कॉमन इफ अ क्वेश्चन अराइजेस if a questions come to you in a paper if they ask you about the common uh, malignant tumor of some mandibular gland you should know about the adenoid cystic tumor if it, if, it, if they ask about the most common benign disease uh, arises in which salivary gland you should know about the uh, parotid gland which one of the following is a most which one of the following is a, arises which gives you the uh, which arises in the parotid gland and the pleomorphic adenoma You should know about that. You can see the mucopyramid histology, and you can see there's a multiple lobules over there. I don't, I don't want to go through this detail because you should know. You do not know about the this histology. So, adenoid cystic. What is adenoid cystic? Adenoid cystic is a Kirby form pattern. Is a differentiated. If the Kirby form like a different sheets, there are different sheets and softened sheets. This is called differentiated. But it has a different sheet with a solid pattern. This is called modern differentiated. And if this appears in a very hard feature, solid features, it's called kind of differentiated. So natural, uh, so adenoid cystic is a Kirby form pattern and a solid pattern. Both patterns you can arise in a an histology pattern. So the, you can get it. There is a solid. This is you can go. Uh, you can get from the an histology. There is a, either it is a differentiated, either it is the moderately differentiated, or the solid. Natural history basically arises from twenty years, for uh, from months to greater than twenty years. Lymph node spread is of less than five percent. Peri neural spread common and can track along the cranial nerves back to the base of the skull. So peri neural spread common and can track along the cranial nerve back to the base of the skull. Forty percent develop pulmonary meds, but survival after ten to twenty years can occur with the pulmonary meds. So primary must be managed. Okay, forty percent develop pulmonary meds, but survival of ten to twenty years can occur with the pulmonary meds. So primary meds must be managed. These are you can see adeno adenoid cystic carcinoma. These are cystic appearance in adenoid tumor. You can see here these are cystic appearance and multiple vocalized. Metastatic disease involving the parotid. How how are uh, how the parotid gland uh, affected from the any metastatic disease from other side of the body. So if if you're talking about the lung carcinoma, bronchogenic carcinoma, it arises through the blood. Hematogenous spread. If you are talking about skin, it arises to the lymphatic spread. And if the skin, which is if skin or bone, like a skull, arise, uh, which are near to the, it can direct extend it to the. So staging, uh, so staging is a simple, very simple. They are the staging is a TNM based staging, the tumor size, nodal involvement, and uh, you know, T1 is less than two centimeter, no extra parenchymal extension. T2 is a greater than two centimeter, but not for greater than four centimeter without extra parenchymal extension. T3 is a greater than four centimeter, and or extra parenchymal extension. T4 a invades skin, mandible, air, cran, anal, and facial nerve. T4 b invades skull base and pericoid plates and the and case and carotid artery. So T1 is a less than two centimeter, no extra parenchymal extension. T2 is a greater than two centimeter, but not four than centimeter. So tumor size is a T1 is a less than two centimeter. T2 is a two for two to between two to four centimeter. And T3 is a bigger than four centimeter with with extra parenchyma extension, like uh, they extend it from the parotid gland capsule. T4 invades skin, mandible, air, facial nerve, artery. So T4 A, T4 B both are invades skin, mandible, air, lobe, facial nerve. T4 B always uh, T4 A is only involving the facial nerve, air canal, mandible, and skin soft tissues, and T4 B involves the hard one like a skull base. Tergoid plates, 
and cases carotid artery so pair tumors now we are talking about the parotid tumors uh, clinically it shows a symptomatic mass if there is a kidney nerve palsy patient will move no, will enable to move uh, one side of the face one shoulder one side of the tongue like a uh, paralysis the same side ipsilateral nerve uh, causes these features trismus to evaluate the pterygoid involvement you can see trismus to evaluate the pterygoid involvement ct mri fna Final respiration biopsy to see the tumor is 90%, 90% sensitive, 90% specific. But we never perform the incisional or excision biopsy for these pair tumors. We will go for the epinephrine. Final respiration. So, lymph node rare or in cystic, 20% positive in the clinical negative tumors. Size and grade are risk factors. 4, 4 cm, 20% occult mates versus 4 cm in smaller tumor. High grade now 49% risk regardless of physiological type versus 7% for low for intermediate. So lymph node uh, rare in adenocystic, but it may 20% positive clinical negative tumors are present. Size grade and risk is 4 cm, 20% 4 cm small tumor. High grade is a 49% risk of acid. Lying 25-30% risk for mucoepidermide adenocystic and malignant mixed tumors. So between the CTS execution. You can see the post operation versus surgery is to leave it. Uh, some mandibular tumor is basically shows the symptomatic mass, painful mass, uh, symptomatic mass, painful mass is the largest cranial nerve palsy, decreases sensation in epsilateral lower teeth. So it's a painful mass, it's a painless mass. Compare always compare both parotid and submandibular. It is the, both are the symptomatic mass, painless. It's a painful mass when it enlarges, it's a painless mass. Cranial nerve palsy it involves the facial nerve, it decreases sensation in epsilateral lower teeth, lip, gums. Unable to move oxidator oral trunk, unable to move part of the face. How would you evaluate the patient? You go go. You can go for the CT MRI to help the distribution of the mass. FNA submandibular tumors you useful only if reveals a malignancy. All regions are approached with a submandibular triangle dissection. Almost never perform CT. So CT MRI help distinguish to pseudo pseudo mass, and FNA is always submandibular. Mass. 98% risk in my tumors, level 1, 2, and 3 most common side distance spread lung, kidney, and bone, and liver. Sublingual tumors, clinical presentations, asymptomatic swelling in the floor of the mouth, kidney nerve palsy, little loss of sensation of one side of tongue. CT, MRI, most tumors are malignant to FNA only, it's useful if malignant. Asymptomatic swelling in the floor of the mouth, kidney nerve palsy, little loss of sensation of one side of tongue. So, sublingual is also asymptomatic swelling, it also a loss of sensation. M CT and MRI, CT and MRI, CT and MRI. Most tumors are malignant, so FNLE only useful if malignant. Always resect with a formal cancer surgery. Lymph nodes the high risk of lymph nodes spread and distal lung skeleton bones and liver. So the treatment, now we are talking about the treatment. And uh, treatment, the periodic 90% are confined to superficial lobe, so we're going to go for superficial periodectomy. But if it's adjusted lobe, deep lobe, not the total periodectomy is involved. If inverse adjusted soft tissue, the radical periodectomy is involved. So always do the surgery after CT and MRI identification point. So, but most commonly we will go for the superficial periodectomy. That's it. Never perform a piecemeal excision and attempt to preserve the facial nerve. Never, nerve grafting can be performed in RT start three to four week post-op without adverse effects. Free syndrome is a complication. Uh, basically, it's a gustatory setting. It's a redirection of parasympathetic sympathetic fibers to the internal side gland. It's basically not a complication. It is just uh, mis the misattachment of the sympathetic when the nerve is uh, cut down, there is a regeneration of the nerve. So it again guards that thing. So don't worry about that thing.
small tumor gland excision acn in block resection with extended supramyohyoid neck dissection sublingual small localized can resect without some mandibular gland and require the resection of some mandibular gland as well so treatment is radiation surgical and resectable tumors ebrd with the photon or electrons conventional altered diffraction resection pachytherapy ebrt nutrition therapy so radiation therapy basically it shows the equal contour vets uh, for equivalent head and neck squamous cell carcinoma cancers so hyperfractions so, you don't have to remember these all conditions so, you should know about the bracket therapy and the nutrient therapy the post operative radiation indications close uh, surgical margins deep operative tumors facial nerve sparing microscopic quality margins so you should know about the uh, post operative radiation when we apply the post operative radiation to patient indications close surgical margins if you are cutting the tumor and you are thinking that it's a tumor which is basically affected very near to that you can go for the close surgical microscopic margins and high grade including cystic and warmed skin bone nerve loss excessive pain or vision no display large tumors requiring a radical resection post operation electron return phase mixed beam 50 80% electron waiting return phase of wet photon return these are the protected uh, treatment of the post operative so portal margins you should know about the portal margin superior top of the acromatic bone inferior hyoid bone you should know about the never about the thing of that you should remember this thing so adenocystic carcinoma post operative radiotherapy always recommended so some mandibular tumor has adenocystic carcinoma it is also recommended the radiotherapy of the post operative post operative therapy of entire pathway of adjacent cranial nerve to the best of skill always recommended so post operative therapy of entire pathway is always recommended adjacent cranial nerve is always recommended the regional lymph node spread is 50% elective nodal radiation is not standard surgical on cell cr and rt 75 80% Morphic adenoma, benign tumor, and the 50 75 percent peritoneal epithelial tumor. Surgery is the treatment of choice. Multiple recurrent tumors can be treated with the RT. Local greater than 3 percent uh, local recurrence. This is the larger lesion for surgical and adequate margins, microscopically positive surgical margins, and microscopic disease, malignant transformations. Highest concentrations of scans in the coral cavity palate and muscle cavity in parents' senses. So the adenocystic is the most common malignant surgical thing. So, fellows, these are the basically all about the cerebral gland tumors. You should know about the superficial things. You don't have to go over deep the for the portal margins and all and the radiation therapy and all. But you just know about the superficial things. What are the most common tumors and what are the treatment of the most common tumors? What are the most common benign tumor of the what is the most common tumor of the so the following uh, i have posted some cues in the in the end of the lectures your people must go for the cues and you most people submit before the uh, time period so i don't have to mention this uh, so kindly do that and then post it there are seven to eight questions i have recorded and you people know must about the this recorded Thank you.